Today we have all sorts of signs and symbols that we see and understand and every day. Words that have meanings, stop signs, some of us don't always recognise the stop signs. Um, and welcome signs, that's hopefully we are welcome at that place or that town. And the other one, don't walk in front of Julian's car. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody know what this word or symbol says? Interesting one. It's the Chinese character for the word cross. And as we look at the character running across the Chinese characters on the left, we start with ten, which means complete and perfect. The second character there is a word or a character to betroth, to bind with a promise to marry. And the third character is a rack or a frame to lay something or to prop up. Interesting, isn't it? What the word crosses. Oop, so doesn't too many. And then as we further look at the characters of that um, those Chinese characters, the second one the little piece above it says, is on the top a roof or a cover and the lower part is to cover the son or a child or an offspring or a seed. The next last character there at the top, the little one on the top left is strength and power. Top right is breath, person or gate. Underneath is the power and strength of the person upon a tree. Amazing, isn't it? As we, as we look at what words mean and um, this Chinese character. Today we're, we're having a look at um, Elisha, the prophet. And in the scripture there's all sorts of symbols and covenants and pictures which point to Christ. We often hear in the Old Testament Christ is concealed, in the New Testament Christ is revealed. And in biblical times, land, names and covenants were important. Often we've, as children, we've heard Bible stories and we've heard of miracles and things and we think oh, that's really great, you know, that's interesting, that's... Um, Wow, that was a great thing that happened at that time. But we often don't see what Christ is, is, is concealed in the Old Testament. And we're going to have a look at some of those things today. This is Elisha's time. The nation was falling apart. Why? Because they'd forgotten about God. They were interested in getting up and having breakfast, grabbing a coffee, off to their job, watching the news, going home, watching Netflix, sport and holidays. And so God's people at the time, instead of influencing culture, culture influenced them and the, nature, the nation was going downhill. They, they worshipped, the other countries around them worshipped false gods and they looked at some of the things that was happening there and God's people introduced that into their own society. They settled for comfort, pleasure and convenience. Does it sound a bit like our nation today, doesn't it? What gets your attention gets you. This is an interesting thing here. What gets your attention gets you is every marketing company, every bank, finance company, Every um, business knows that if they go out and they advertise stuff, what gets your attention gets you. You know, as you walk down the grocery aisle, you see, oh, yeah, that's the cereal I saw advertised on TV. I might try that. And so in this time, things that got people's attention turned their hearts away from God. And in the middle of the mid midst, in the middle of the mess comes Elisha. 
And Elisha's name meant, my God is salvation. So interesting, in all this time in the mess, this guy, Elisha, comes along and his name means, my God is salvation. And Elisha's message was, give your attention to God. And so going back, we have to go back a little bit to Elijah. So I hope I don't get the two mixed up today, Elisha and Elijah. But uh, Elijah was um, given instructions to anoint Elisha as a prophet. Elijah had been depressed. He ran away. He was uh, ran away, hid in a cave, wanted to die and told God, I'm the only one left. There's no other Christians around. There's nobody that loves you, Lord. And the Lord said to him, there are 7,000 left. And he gave Elisha the instructions. Then the Lord said to him, Elijah, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola. Good way to say. You shall anoint as your prophet in your place. <clears throat> and it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all those all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So Elijah was not on his own. There were 7,000. So what was Elisha? Oh, sorry. Here we go. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat who was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen before him and he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please kiss me, my father. Please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And he said, Go back for what, I have, what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. So what was he doing when Elijah came? He was ploughing. Well, not quite like that, but he was ploughing with 12 oxen which was probably like a big tractor at the time because somebody who had 12 oxen was pretty wealthy. I'm sure that um, 12 oxen could plough in 15 acres in the day when somebody with two oxen could only plough in one or two acres. And so then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and says, please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I'll follow you. And he said, go back again for what have I done for you. There was a significance of the mantle. There was a, a symbol in it. It implied connection with God, covenant, it was a calling to make God's word known, power and authority from God to do it. And today, at great expense to the management, we have got an, a replica of Elijah's mantle. And this is Elisha driving the oxen. And this is Elijah bringing his mantle. And so what, did, what special things did Elisha have to receive it? You know, what was his qualifications? Did he 
have a special connection to receive this power and calling? Was he super spiritual? Was he good at praying? Did he go to church every Sunday? Did he even like going to church? We don't know. But how did he get this incredible connection? It looks like it was just given to him, wasn't it? That's like us. Life with God is first and foremost about receiving. Elisha knew exactly what was implied, in the implied agreement of receiving this mantle. There was a lot of stuff connected with it. There was power, connection, calling, calling to be a leader, power and authority from God. It was a defining moment in Elisha's life. But it was the call for his, him to be a prophet, but there was no ceremony, there was no band playing, there was no sort of big thing. Hey, this is the start of your ministry to be a prophet. No, it was just about receiving. A few weeks ago I spoke at communion about the Hebrew tradition of a, of a guy going and asking the father for the daughter's hand to be a bride. And you remember that uh, the father poured the wine and gave it to the future son-in-law and he then passed it to the bride and f or the future bride. And for her to become the future bride, to accept it, she had to receive it and accept it. And it's like us. God's salvation for us is about receiving it's about what Christ offers us. It's all about receiving his gift of salvation to us. In receiving, we have to take it. Elisha, to receive the jacket, he didn't have to tick the boxes. He didn't have to tick off all the boxes to receive the gift. We just have to receive it from God. Elisha, so Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. So he was selling his big tractor, wasn't he? He was um, killing off the oxen. He was giving up his farming life to go and follow Elijah. So. At the farm, he was his own boss. He could decide when he got up. He could decide what he did for the day. Um, but now he was going to have a new boss. There was no turning back, even in the down times. If you think about killing off his 12 oxen, um, think about this. 12 oxen with an average 100 kilos of meat would have provided 6, 7,680 kilos, about 65,000 burgers. So it fed a lot of people, didn't it? So his commitment to follow after Elijah was really strong. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. And there was a number of prophet schools, and these prophet schools had been started by Samuel, way back in the time of David. And um, Elijah looked after a number of prophets schooled, and Elisha was his servant or student at one of these schools. So Elisha spent up to 10 years in one of these schools. So it was like a Bible college or a school of ministry, as we've just heard from Uganda and what's happening in Zambia. So it was like going to a school of ministry. And they were founded upon the belief upon belief as the first principle, belief in God's active communication to his people and belief in the salvation God provides for his people. These prophetic schools were faith-based educational institutions. Mm -hmm. 
The sentence says, he arose and followed Elijah and became a servant. And at the end of 10 years at prophet school, what was Elisha's qualifications? During those 10 years, did he see fantastic ministry? Did he do great miracles? Did he experience great things? Nothing. It says nothing during that time. I'm sure that during that time there were other students at the prophet school that said, hey, we've just been down to Bethel for a mission weekend and, and it was fantastic and we had a great time and Elisha says, I wish. You know, how many times we often hear people giving great testimonies and we think God's not doing anything in my life, I wish, you know. And so there's some of these testimonies are a highlight reel of what's happening in a person's life and sometimes they go through, we all go through times of desert times, wilderness times when we don't see anything happening. And so at the end of 10 years, um, we hear something about Elisha in 2 Kings. And in 2 Kings it says, An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. So at the end of 10 years, like even a school of ministry, you finish phase 1, 2 or 3, you get a certificate. We print a certificate out for the students. Here at the end of 10 years in private school, um, Elisha's qualification was I can pour water on the hands of the leader. Not real great if you're going for a job, is it? And so during these 10 years, what was Elisha doing? He was learning, serving, obeying, doing some lowly tasks. Just, Elijah would come along, water, please, you know. Pour water on his hands. I guess there was times when he wanted to go back to the farm and be his own boss, but whoops, there's no oxen are gone, aren't they? We read in, in the New Testament of, of people like Peter, when Peter um, didn't know what to do or got fed up, he went back fishing, didn't he? And uh, just to be his own boss, he knew what he was getting every day. But with Christ and us, your life isn't yours anymore. You were bought with a price. The disciples went from their life of knowing what they were doing every day. They could say, well, I'm going to fish, I'm going to feed my family, to a life dependent upon Jesus to lead them. From making their own decisions to living a life dependent upon Jesus to guide them, to use their talents. I guess there was times when the disciples went, well, said, have you bought lunch? Did you bring any sandwiches today? We're walking with Jesus. What are we going to eat? And um, John, it was your turn to bring the sandwiches. I didn't bring the sandwiches. And I doubt that Thomas bought sandwiches. And uh, so we learned to live on dependence upon Christ. And so this is Elisha's story. You see the sentence there that says he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Very significant sentence that we just often just glance over. But there was 10 years of him learning and serving and character takes time to be developed. There's no shortcuts. Significant stuff takes time. Ken's often mentioned training for reigning, hasn't he, on different people. And you look at David, he was about 15 years after he was anointed before he was king. You look at Joseph, he spent quite a number of years, I think 13 years in prison before he was reigning. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness. And so Elisha, he was a farmer, so a farmer is get used to putting the seed in the ground and then waiting and waiting for the moisture to be right, for rain, for the plant to grow. He doesn't sort of dig it up the next day, brush the dirt off and say, why, why haven't you grown, you know? So it's significant stuff takes time. 
if you look at failures in the business world, in the professional world, even in the, the religious world, failures are not usually a lack of ability, but they're a lack of character. Oh, I didn't really mean to take this money, or I shouldn't have done that sort of deal, or I shouldn't have done this. And so the failures are usually a lack of character. So after this time at the uh, prophet school, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind near the city of Jericho and he drops his cloak and Elijah picks it up and he'd asked for a double blessing through his ministry. Elijah had asked for a double blessing and Elijah said, if you're there when I'm taken up to heaven and you pick up my cloak, you'll get a double blessing. And so Elijah had 35 years ministry, Elisha 70 years. And so then we pick up in 2 Kings when just after Elijah was taken up into heaven, um, the man of the city of Jericho said to Elisha, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the wood is bad and the ground barren. So to understand why Jericho had a water problem, we need to rewind back to the years of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Joshua had cursed the city. We don't know why, it doesn't say. We're not told. But Joshua, in Joshua 6, Joshua says, At that time Joshua pronounced the solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city, Jericho, at the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up his gates. So Jericho lay in ruins for 500 years. 500 years is quite a long time. If you, we go back 500 years from today, Anne Boleyn became the queen in UK, in London, England. She lost her head not long after that. Martin Luther had just started preaching in Wittenberg at the beginning of the Reformation. Spanish explorer Ferdinand Magellan, his ship had just returned to Spain after circumnavigating the world and stopping off in the Philippines. So 500 years is quite a while, isn't it? 500 years, long time. And then along comes this guy here in blue called Hyle. He came along and I think he was a real estate guy because all he could see was location, location, location. The city was ruined, in ruins, but he could see it was a good location because the river Jordan was nearby and it, it all looked great to him. Isn't it a real estate sort of thing? And so he started building the foundations and he starts building the foundation and his oldest son, Abraham, dies. Whoops. But he carries on building and he hangs the gates on the city and his youngest son, Segub, dies. What doesn't he understand about the curse on the city? Then we go back to two kings, where the men of the city came to Elisha. And they said, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. So the city had been rebuilt, but the water was toxic and nothing would grow. People were sick. Women were having miscarriages. The city was not travelling very well. This is a picture of the spring and also uh, a fountain which is there today, or near the spring. Um, Jericho is said to be one of the oldest cities of the world. 
and it's at one of the lowest places, it's 1300 feet below sea level. If you've had anything to do with water purification or something like that, if you're below sea level, I'm sure there's a lot of things could seep through and destroy the water. Eh? <laughs> and so this is Elisha he says to the men of the city bring me a new bowl and put salt in it so they brought it to him then he went to the source of the water and cast the salt cast in the salt there and said thus says the Lord I have healed this water from there on there shall be no more death or barrenness. Today we have also a new bowl with salt. And so what does Elisha do? And sorry to those that's got to vacuum up later. <laughs> but Elisha goes along and he does that. at the source of the water. And so the men of the, men of the city said, whoa, 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 hey, hang on. How can a pinch of salt take away the curse of 500 years of this toxic water? How can it happen? Just a pinch of salt? Is that all that's needed? The situation may seem hopeless to us. Can a new bowl with a pinch of salt in it, or with salt in it, change stuff? Difficult. Maybe not. What do we know about salt? If you're a cook, you know that you need a bit of salt to bring out the flavour. If you put too much salt in, as I know sometimes <laughs> I've done, it doesn't taste so good. But salt's used for curing meat, etc. But it's just salt. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And they brought it to him. And here we read in Leviticus 2.13, and every offering of your grain offering, you shall season it with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. To the people of the Near East, to God's people, salt meant a lot. Salt was aligned with covenant or agreements. So, salt, goodbye curse. The salt was an everlasting, a symbol of the incorruptible, everlasting character of God. God says salt is associated with his covenant with his people. Going the wrong way. Got upside down, haven't I? And he said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed the water. From there on, there shall be no more death or barrenness. So he said, You know, sprinkle of salt, you're good to go. And uh, we see that the salt was applied at the source. He didn't go downstream, but he went where the heart was, where the spring was. As in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. It's not just an outward thing that is changed in our lives. It's not being changed at the mouth of the river, because that wouldn't do anything, but it's being changed at the heart. 
When the spring changed, the water changed. When your life is changed by the power of God, other lives will be changed. The scripture says in John 7:38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow out from them. And so here we see the new bowl filled with salt. The covenant agreement takes away the curse of the city. Does that bring anything to mind? Jesus, with the new, the new covenant, takes away the curse. So we read in Luke 22, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. The blood of Jesus, that is the symbol the salt represents. The blood of Jesus is bigger and better than the salt that cured the curse of the city. The blood of Christ puts an end to every hopeless situation in our lives. Christ is bigger in Christ. When we know our identity and our position, there are no hopeless situations. We don't have to live under the power of sin's curse. In Galatians 3, 13 and 14, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Two Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When Jesus Christ comes into our life, he turns it around completely. The presence of Jesus in a person's life changes everything about that person. Jericho was no longer a city with a curse. The power of the curse had gone. If I am in Christ, a new creation, I am free, accepted as a child of God. No circumstances can get in the way of forgiveness of Christ Jesus. The only thing that can get in the way is unbelief. My new identity is in Christ. The flesh and sin are still there, but the power has been broken by Jesus, who conquered sin and death. So how long did this healing last? We read back in 2 Kings, so the water remained healed to this day according to the word which Elisha spoke. And if you check today, what's happening in the spring there, today the average discharge from the spring is approximately 10,800 litres per minute clean water for the city. It provides irrigation for orange and lemon trees, date palms, flowers and spices. And I know some people in our congregation here have been there um, and seen those orange <coughs> trees and lemon trees. The healing of the water lasted forever. An archaeologist wrote when the orange and lemon trees are in bloom in the spring, the air is so heavy that their perf with their perfume that the visitor is sure he could bottle some of it and take it home. The streams that surrounded Jericho still looked the same after they were healed, but they were as different as night and day. Once they killed, they were toxic, nothing grew. Now they bought life. A person who is born again may look the same, 
but once he was dead, now he is alive. For the first time in his life, he is fully alive. And we thank the Lord for that. Once I was dead, but now I'm alive. Thank you. Jericho today is flourishing. It's fruitful and it's flourishing and it's got a fragrance. When I was reading what that archaeologist had said that the air is heavy with the perfume of the, the fragrance of the trees, I was thinking how great it is. A new bowl, Life with Jesus Christ, filled with covenant stuff, changes everything. And we're made new and we're a fragrance to God. Christ in us, the Holy Spirit living in us, you and me every day, every moment, will make an everlasting change in our lives. Our focus is on Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Thank you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this lesson from the Old Testament as we see a bowl filled with, with salt, a new bowl filled with salt. It's about Christ and his covenant to us, his blood poured out for us. And we thank you, Jesus, that in you we have new life, new beginnings. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.